So let me first uh, go ahead and welcome all of you to the Islamic Society of Leading American Muslims, an organization that was established to conduct da'wah, to call people to Islam, and to invite, educate, and empower them along with Muslims that detached from Islam and came back to Islam. We are an organization that prohibits criticism, castigation, condemnation. We're here to invite, not to indict, and we're here to build. So we are a foundation, an organization <laughs> love uh -huh. and uh -huh. it was well, good. Uh, love and radical welcome, alhamdulillah. So um, I want to thank those of you who that support this organization, whether it's a volunteer, Leif, uploading the videos, Mason co-hosting, making desserts for the potlucks and all the wonderful things that so many people do. Um, I just can't thank you enough. And I ask Allah to bless you with uh, the best of this life and the hereafter. Um, in terms of announcements, uh, Naran uh, will be doing a prayer service with People of Diversity, which will be aired on Sunday, August the 28th. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about one of my big joys, which, is, which are the potlucks that we have on a monthly basis. Um, the Quran and Sunnah emphasizes the virtues and benefits of Muslims spending time together, particularly in the context of brotherhood and sisterhood, community and mutual support. And Surah al Gujarat uh, 49 verse 10, the believers are but brothers and sisters, so make settlement between your brothers and sisters and fear that, and fear a lot that you may receive mercy. So there's actually a mercy in being merciful to your brothers and sisters. Uh, when things are settled and you're at peace and your relationships are whole, you actually receive mercy from Allah. So this verse here highlights the importance of maintaining unity and brotherhood and sisterhood among Muslims. We know that spending time together helps in fostering and strengthening the bonds between us. Surah uh, Al-Ma'ida and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. In fear of Allah, indeed Allah is severe in penalty. This verse encourages Muslims toward collaboration and virtuous deeds. Even we are enjoined in Surah 5, verse 48, and Surah Al Baqarah, verse 148, to buy, to compete for good deeds. And then the hadith from Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet Muhammad said, the example of the believers in their mutual love, mercy, and companion or compassion, companionship is like that of a body. If one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. So this hadith emphasizes the interconnectedness of the Muslim community, underscoring the importance of spending time together to foster love and compassion. And then I know I'm not doing a khutbah on this today or a halakha, but it's part of our announcements that I want to reiterate how important it is for Muslims to be with other Muslims. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, a Muslim is the brother, sister of another Muslim. He or she neither wrongs him or her nor hands him or her over to one who does wrong them. Whoever fulfills the needs of his brother or sister, Allah will fulfill his needs. If you want to get your needs met, then fulfill the needs of another brother and sister in the community. So again, this hadith encourages Muslims to be actively involved in each other's lives, offering support and companionship. Uh, spending time with fellow Muslims can strengthen one's iman. And I had the honor and blessing to be the khatib at the Masjid al Haq in downtown Orlando Friday. And my khutbah was about strengthening our iman, building our iman. So again, spending time with fellow Muslims can strengthen our faith, our iman, through reminders, shared worship, and encouragement in good deeds. Uh, it helps create an environment where we are motivated to maintain and increase in our spirituality and our man. Mutual support and encouragement. Um, Muslims are encouraged to support each other, especially in times of difficulty. So by spending time together, we provide emotional and practical support, which is highly valued in Islam. So when Muslims gather, we know that they often share knowledge about the Quran, Sunnah, and Islamic teachings. 
which helps in continuous learning and application of Islamic principles in daily life. Getting together as Muslims is also a protection for the shaitan. Prophet Salam said, mentioned that shaitan is more likely to influence an individual who is alone, but when Muslims are together, they are less likely to be misled. The Prophet Salam emphasized the importance of praying in congregation. So we know that when we do the Maghrib prayer, which we always build our services and our potlucks, no matter what Islam does, it's always built around a prayer. Um, so spending most time together as Muslims is highly virtuous and beneficial. It fosters brotherhood, unity, mutual support, which is essential for maintaining a strong and cohesive Muslim community. Whether through worship, shared activities, or simply being there for one another, the emphasis is on creating a supportive and righteous environment that benefits everyone involved. Potlucks realize the value of socialization, human connection, brother and sisterhood. And with that being said, would anyone like to host a potluck on the last Saturday of this month, which is August the 3rd? Um, please, if you would like to, email me if you have a home that will um, accommodate. We usually have a, anywhere from 20 to 35 people. Um, so I I shared this valuable information to encourage you to get the blessings of actually creating that space. Otherwise, we are happy to have it here. We just don't like to put the hardship on brothers and sisters to have to drive here to New Smyrna Beach. But if no one offers, alhamdulillah, um, we will have it here. Please continue to pray for James and Julie, make dua for them and their family. Um, and so I'm going to do a little review from the last class, uh, because last week we're at the Unitarian Universalist Church speaking about women in Islam. So I'm going to do a little review from our week before that and then go into some new material. So in the July the 21st class, we drew inspiration from the profound exploration of one of the most critical aspects of Islamic theology. Rooted in the teaching of a statement and the teaching of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is recorded in Sunan Ibn Majah, every son and daughter of Adam commits sin. And the best of those who commit sin are those who repent. So we started this study on Talba and we will be dealing with Talba unless there's something in the Islamic calendar that we need to learn the virtues about. We will be dealing with Talba the next couple of classes, inshallah, if Allah wills. Um, this lecture actually challenges the conventional association of sin. Uh, the lecture we did on the 21st um, was darkness and negativity. It's interesting that I had read about this religion for seven years before I did my Shahada. And the way it was projected to me was this hellfire and brimstones and damnation sort of heaviness. I stopped for a law of being. The more I read, the more I discovered the beauty, the amazing mercy of Allah in the acts of Tawbah. So that particular lecture challenged that conventional association with darkness and negativity and reminded us that Tawbah was a pathway to righteousness and a noble standing with Allah. As the Quran in Surah Al Baqarah, verse 222, beautifully states, indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repentant and loves those who purify themselves. So, as an indicator here, that the more we repent, the more pure we are. And we know that the Prophet, who was a perfect man, would say astaghfirullah 1,000 times a day. So, here again, if you want to practice the Sunnah, if you want to practice what the Prophet did, you must constantly be repenting. So this simply or simple yet powerful teaching highlighted a cornerstone of Islamic theology, the potency, virtues, benefits, and advantages of repentance or tolva. And it might seem counterintuitive to regard those who sin and repent as the best among humanity. And just recapping a little bit on the last class. Yet this perspective is precisely what makes Talba such a transformative 
and hopeful concept. It is important that we learn to embrace and not resist our human nature. To be human is to be imperfect. If you strive to be perfect, you will be defeated from the beginning because that is not available. We can be angel-like, we can purify ourselves and actually be better than the angels, but we will never be perfect. Each one of us is bound to err, but it is through recognition of our mistakes and turning back to a law that we really elevate ourselves as seekers of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. It's how we go from the dirt to the angelic qualities. How we go from that piece of clay like Adam Ali Salam to that great man or woman of God. In Surah al Baqarah, verse 222, it beautifully states Indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repentant and loves those who purify themselves. The core belief is not only confronting but also empowering, comforting, I mean, but it's also empowering, highlighting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and mercy are always within our reach, no matter our transgressions. Tawbah was actually depicted as a gift, and uh, I really hope, brothers and sisters, that you can let go of any kind of past knowledge that you had if it was not accommodated or accompanied by the Quran and Sunnah. So Talba is depicted as a gift, a transformative journey that shapes our outlook on life, knowing that we can be forgiven if we do err, striving not to, but knowing that we can be forgiving, knowing that this allows us to realign our lives with divine guidance, to fortify our man, to build a fortress around our heart of trust in Allah and protect ourselves from doubt and despair providing a moral compass that guides us through life's challenges. As I said in my khutbah, interestingly enough, on Friday, if your iman is strong, no matter whether you're dealing with terminal illness, no matter whether you're dealing with a major loss in a business or a home or something, everything is alhamdulillah, everything is a gift from Allah. It is not, it is a sin, actually, to not have hope in Allah's mercy, and it is a sin to despair of Allah's mercy. Those people go, oh, I'm so worried. I don't know if Allah's going to forgive me. Oh, my God. Well, then they need to read Surah 39, verse 53. Say, O Ibadi, my servants, who have transgressed against themselves by committing evil deeds and sins, despair not of the mercy of Allah. Truly, Allah forgives all sins. Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. So, that lecture underscored that Talba was both an outward and inward endeavor involving regret for one's sins, seeking forgiveness directly from Allah without any intermediaries, and committing to self-improvement. It is a path that not only cleanses us of our past misdeeds, but also strengthens our relationship with our Creator, filling our hearts with hope and motivation. It should not be damnation, it should be motivation. And it's, even if you look at the Quran, 114 chapters, 113 of them begin with in the name of Allah, the merciful and the compassionate. Only Surah Tawbah, the Surah named for repentance, does not have this. In exploring the concept of Tawbah, the lecture also contrasted Islamic teachings with other religious teachings offering a comprehensive understanding of repentance, unique features in Islam. And we went over how other religions, you have to do something or you have to, somebody else did it for you or a saint did it for you or some pious person. This is all shirk. That lecture beautifully explained how Talba is a return to Allah, a humble admission of our fallibility and a sincere plea for forgiveness and redemption. One of the remarkable aspects of Tawbah is that it emphasizes a direct relationship between the believer and the loss of Panama Ta'ala, personal relationship. Islam forbids any form of intermediary and in seeking forgiveness, ensuring that we turn solely to Allah with sincerity and humility. This direct connection reinforces our accountability and the boundless mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. 
Tauba is more than just seeking forgiveness. It is a comprehensive process involving regret for our sins, a firm intention to avoid them in the future, and an earnest effort to make amends. If you've only repented, you've only done 50% of the job. Repenting is 50% and amending is the other 50%. Isa alayhi salam said, let those that sin, sin no more. Let those that steal, steal no more, but rather labor with their hands, that which is good and seemingly to the Lord. So we have personal responsibility. So this personal responsibility and understanding from the last fast um, helps us process uh, shapes our it, this process shapes our moral compass. Uh, it guides us to live righteous lives and continuously strive for spiritual growth. It is not a one-time act, repentance, but a continuous journey. And the Quran reassures us, but indeed I am the perpetual forgiver, mashallah, of whoever repents and believes and does righteousness and then continues in guidance. Our faith teaches us that no sin is too great to be forgiven. Allah's mercy is all-encompassing, and Allah is always ready to accept our repentance. This understanding dispels any notions of hopelessness and motivates us to seek Allah's forgiveness earnestly. The lecture further enriched our understanding by examining the creation story of Adam and Hawa, emphasizing and reminding us of the importance of seeking forgiveness as they did, and the powerful reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Despite their disobedience, Allah taught them the words of repentance and accepted it, setting a precedent for all of humanity, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a mercy to all mankind. Their story reassured us that no sin is too great to be forgiven and that Allah as a wajal's mercy is all encompassing. Again, this perspective dispels hopelessness and inspires us to continuously seek Allah's forgiveness with hope and determination. That lecture addressed the afterlife, repentance, and redemption. The lecture highlighted how Tawba facilitates moral development and underscored the importance of accountability to Allah alone. So hopefully the comprehensive approach of this class and the subsequent classes in this series on Tawba will encourage us to embrace the transformative power of Tawba, urge us to turn to Allah with sincere hearts, and strive for continuous self-improvement. The class was meant to be a call to action, inspiring us to recognize our fallibility, seek forgiveness, and strengthen our relationship with Allah as a wajah. So let us take this moment to reflect on our lives and embrace this transformative power of Tawbah. Let us turn to Allah with sincere hearts, seek Allah's forgiveness, and strive to live righteously. By doing so, we not only cleanse our souls, but also build a stronger, more hopeful connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll begin with the khutbah al -hajj. That's just a little review, and we will enter into new material today, inshallah. And alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'kru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. May yahdihillahu fala mudilla wa may yutlil fala hadiyala wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa dahula sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasul. All praise be to Allah. We seek Allah's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our souls and from our bad deeds. Whom Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomever Allah leads astray, no one can God. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity but Allah, the one having no partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's final slave and messenger. Ya yuhaladina amanu taqu laha Ya yuhaladina amanu taqu laha katu katihi walla tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun O you who have believed, fear Allah as Allah alone should be feared, and do not die except as Muslims 
in submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal nas utaku rabbakum maladhi kalakakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaka minha sarjah wa batha min humu rijalan kathira wa nasa'a wa taku la ladhi tasa'aluna bihi wa alham inna laha kana alaykum raqiba O people be dutiful to your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed for both many women and men. And fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and revere the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever over you, al an observer. Ya yuladina amanu taqu laha wa kulu kaulan sadida yusle lekum malikum wa yak kirlikum danubakum wa may yuta ilaha rasuluhu fakad bawa wa fawz on adhima. Oh, you who have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. Allah will then amend for you your deeds and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and Allah's mercy has certainly attained the greatest attainment. So today we continue to reflect upon one of the most profound and transformative aspects of our faith, the concept of repentance or Talba in Islam. Talba is not merely a ritual or an act. It is a journey towards self-purification. It is a journey toward Tazkiyah. It is a return to our creator and a testament to the boundless mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forgiveness is Allah as a wajal's sole authority and boundless mercy. In the vast expanse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy lies that every believer must grasp. This truth that every believer must grasp, ultimate forgiveness in the hereafter belongs solely to Allah. It is part of Allah's sovereignty. This divine reality offers us both comfort and clarity guiding us toward a path of true repentance. While we are encouraged to seek forgiveness from one another for personal wrongs, it is only through Allah as a wajal that we find the absol absolution of our sins. No human, no created being has the power to forgive sins in the ultimate sense. Sincere, repentiment, sincere repentance and forgiveness for our sins can only be sought through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This principle, deeply rooted, enshrined in the essence of Islam, distinguishes our faith from others, reaffirming the purity of Tawheed. In the Holy Quran, the three highest values are Tawheed, Tazkiyah, and Imran, the creating and the building of a society with faith. And we will never build a society with faith until we purify ourselves. And we will never purify ourselves until we are forgiven. And we will never ever be successful as Muslims until we deeply understand Tawheed. Forgiveness at a human level between people for injustice toward one another are discussed under the practical aspects of Tawba concerning sins pertaining to the rights of humanity. Another lecture, in other words. Islam explicitly forbids intermediaries for this purpose. No intermediary, whether an idol, a saint, or even a prophet holds the authority to forgive sins. You will see certain religions that will hang saints on their rearview mirrors trusting the saint instead of the creator of the saint to provide safety for them. You will find in certain religions that people will put an amulet of a saint in the crib of a baby, trusting that saint instead of trusting Allah. This is ultimate shell, ultimate jahal, ultimate ignorance. In terms of direct authority in Tawheed, the Quran states in Surah as sajda Surah 32, verse 4, you have not besides Allah any protector or any intercessor. So will you not be reminded? So Allah tells us here, it's not available. 
This verse is a powerful call to every soul, urging us to recognize that Allah alone is our protector, our intercessor, and the one to whom all forgiveness belongs. You see, my beloved brothers and sisters, Islam came to rectify and purify the Christians already immersed in Sheikh, making it forbidden and hated in the sight of Allah as the worst of sins one requiring Tawbah in this life, seeking repentance in this life. Islam came to guide humanity away from Shep, the gravest sin of associating partners with Allah. As Shirk or associating partners with Allah is considered again the gravest sin. In Surah 4 verse 16, we find what is translated, indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And one who associates others with Allah has certainly gone far astray. When you are making association with Allah, you are not in the Surat al-Mustaqim. You cannot be in the Surat al-Mustaqim, and you are actually invalidating your shahada, as shadun la ilaha illallah, wa shadun la Muhammad rasulullah this understanding of Talba establishes the overreaching mercy of Allah toward Allah's servants in that there is no sin regardless of its magnitude and proportion, including Shaf, except that there exists by the mercy, the shah, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a path of return for the one who is sincere in Talba. This prohibition of making partners with Allah protects the sanctity of our iman, our faith, and reinforces that there is always a path of return for those who sincerely repent, no matter what the sins. And let me throw something else in here, because we are not our thoughts. If you are always thinking about your sins, you will be deluded to believe that that defines you, that one act or that two things or three things that you did. So this direct personal approach that we don't need a priest, we don't need a saint, we don't need something, some idol. This direct personal approach is our safeguard. Just think about how humiliating it is for people to go and confess to some human being and then to feel unequal, less than that person they confess to. When Allah said the only way that we can have superiority over another is through piety. So this direct personal approach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this 1-800 number that goes straight through to Allah is our safeguard. It is not, it not only protects us from those unsanctioned to speak on Allah's behalf, but it also ensures that our repentance is pure, undefiled, sincere, and devoid, and directed to the one. It is our sincere repentance is untainted by any intermediaries who might actually exploit our vulnerabilities. And how many times have we seen how priests, leaders, people with power have usurped their power and exploited the vulnerabilities of their students? In a world where humans can be harsh and compassion be scarce, how can we depend on a human being when we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah and Wajal's mercy remains unparalleled. No one can be as merciful as Allah, and no one can surpass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's boundless compassion. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded us in Sahih Bukhari, even the best of deeds will not grant us paradise and unless Allah bestows his pardon and mercy upon us. This reminder, along with the loss of Panama to Allah's immediate forgiveness of Adam and the honor that he bestowed upon him, serves as a source of immense relief and encouragement for every single sinner. The power of Tawba is undeniable. It has the psychological, spiritual, and moral impact to bring us back from the brink of despair to turn our hearts toward hope and to inspire us to strive for moral excellence. Understanding Talba opens a river, my beloved brothers and sisters, of benefit 
deepening our relationship with the creator and allowing us to grow spiritually and morally. It is this connection with the law as a gel that provides us with hope and motivation, the hope and motivation we so desperately need in a world of darkness. And this hope and motivation are said to be two of the most valuable traits in this world and the keys to success in the hereafter. The Quran reminds us so beautifully in Surah Imran, verse 135, chapter 3, and those who, when they commit an immorality or wrong themselves by transgressions, remember Allah and seek forgiveness for their sins, and who can forgive sins except Allah, and who do not persist in what they have done while they know. So Allah is a wajal here again. We see Allah's tremendous mercy and kindness toward the believers. This verse calls us to remember Allah, seek Allah as a wajal's forgiveness, and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, knowing that no sin is too great to be forgiven when we turn to Allah in sincere, in sincere repentance. Through this relationship, we maintain dignity and embrace the boundless mercy of Allah. This direct personal relationship with the, between the believer and Allah emphasizes the importance of personal accountability and the mercy of Allah, who is always ready to forgive those sincerely turning to him. In this we find the essence of true forgiveness a forgiveness that not only cleanses us, but elevates our, our ranks, elevates us in our ranks as seekers of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. Drawing us closer to the one who alone holds the key to mercy and grace. In this we find not just guidance, but a profound and inspiring path to true well-being and divine connection. Allah's mercy, my beloved brothers and sisters, is boundless. Just stop for a moment and just process the horrible things that we might have done in the past that Allah has just forgiven us and our sins are buried in the depths of the sea. And scientists have said that the vibration of the floor of the ocean is so powerful that the, if something is there for a second, it's erased. And this is the powerful bounty of Allah. In the vastness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, there is a promise that shines brighter than any despair we could ever have. No matter how far we may have strayed, Allah's forgiveness is always there. It is within reach. In Surah al zamar 39 verse 53, O oh, my servants who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, do not do not, it's a commandment of Allah, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. A deed, it is Allah who is the forgiving, the merciful. The Quran called out to us with a message of hope and redemption, not a hope of damnation and despair. Allah invites us to seek his forgiveness directly. This divine invitation is a beacon of light in our darkest moments, reminding us that Allah's mercy knows no bounds. Allah is waiting for us with his hands out, come back to me, repent to me, and reunite with me. It is a mercy that embraces us, heals us, and lifts us from the weight of our sins, no matter how heavy they may seem. Allah's mercy is not just a passive attribute it actively calls us to return, to seek Allah's forgiveness, and to strive for betterment with the assurance that Allah is always ready to accept us. In this boundless mercy, we find not just forgiveness, but also the strength to improve, the strength to purify ourselves, the strength to build better habits, to rise above our weaknesses, and to walk the path of righteousness. Every command of Sharia, every law ordained by Allah as a wajal carries within it the wisdom, the hikmah of our preservation and the protection of our well-being. It is a divine blueprint designed to shield us from harm and guide us toward a life of purity and goodness.
So let us never lose hope. Never, ever lose hope. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is greater than our sins. Let us embrace this mercy. Seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness with sincerity and walk the path that leads us back to Allah, knowing that in Allah's infinite mercy, we will always find a refuge and a way forward. This divine mercy offers us hope and encouragement to continually seek Allah's forgiveness and strive to improve. Another central principle in Islam is that all matters legislated by Allah, the Sharia, inherently carry good for the preservation and well-being not only of us individually, but of humanity and protection against haram. I want us to look at a moment in time, at the power of sincere repentance. In the heart of Islam lies a beautiful promise that fills every believer with hope. No sin is too great to be forgiven if one sincerely repents. This is the profound beauty of our faith, our deen, a beauty that transforms lives, heals hearts, and renews spirits. The world of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these words of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam echo through time, offering us solace and encouragement. The one who repents from sin is like the one who did not sin. And this is in Sunan Ibn Majah. So when you repent, it is if you did not sin. Allahu Akbar. This assurance is more than a promise. It is a lifeline. It is the key that unlocks the chains of guilt and despair, setting us free to return to Allah with renewed hope and unwavering determination. It's the best octane of gas. In the embrace of sincere repentance, we find relief from the burdens of our past are lifted. We experience spiritual rejuvenation as our connection with Allah as a wajal is restored, and we gain moral clarity as we are guided back to the path of righteousness. This assurance of forgiveness offers immense psychological, spiritual, and moral relief, encouraging us to return to Allah again, not only with hope and determination, but without guilt. And as a therapist, we know that one of the things that dysregulates human beings the most is being guilty. <clears throat> so repentance is not just a return. It's in fact a rebirth. It is a powerful act of faith that transforms our hearts, purifies our soul, and draws us closer to Allah's infinite mercy. So let's seize this moment with both hands knowing that no matter how far we have fallen, the door of Allah's forgiveness is always open to us. With sincere repentance, we can rise above our past and step into a future filled with hope, guided by the boundless mercy of the one who loves to forgive. This role of Sharia, of Islamic law, is a path to well-being and divine connection. Obedience to that, and repentance when we disobey. And this repentance involves a sense of omission and commission. When I commit something Allah has prohibited, I must repent. When I don't do something that Allah has commanded, I must repent. So these laws, this Sharia is designed to preserve and enhance our well-being, guiding us to a life of justice, mercy, and wisdom. Ibn al qayyim captures this beautifully when he says the Islamic law is all about hikmah, wisdom, and achieving people's welfare in this life and the hereafter. It is about justice, mercy, wisdom, and good. If we are emulating the Prophet, وسلم, we will be people of mercy and will be people of forgiveness on this earth plane. This essence of Sharia is not just a set of rules, but a divine framework and blueprint designed to uplift humanity, ensuring that every action leads us closer to the ultimate good. Alhamdulillah. Thus, any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with its opposite, 
common good with mischief, or witness with nonsense, wisdom, sorry, with nonsense, is a ruling that does not belong to the Islamic law, even if it is claimed to be so according to someone's interpretation. I think I've given you sufficient proofs from the Quran and the Ahadith that we have established this sovereign authority and this power of Allah. We now understand that Tawbah or sincere repentance is a vital part of this divine law, fostering a direct, sincere, and personal relationship with Allah, a gnosis and experiential knowledge of this forgiveness. If we don't practice repentance, we will never experience what it's like to experience these promises of Allah. If we don't have this knowledge, we won't know what to expect. It protects us again from exploitation by those who might misuse their authority, ensuring that our repentance is pure and sincere, directed only toward the one who knows our hearts and our intentions. The prohibition of shirk or associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a treasure of hikmah, a treasure of wisdom. By turning directly to Allah, we establish a connection that is untainted by anything less than the creator, intermediaries. A connection, again, that is pure, honest, and transformative. I pray that you're hearing this, and I am repeating a lot of the things twice and three times, because that's what the Prophet did when, Sallallahu when he was saying something of such intense importance for the believers to absorb and for the believers to materialize and realize in their lives. It is not the most natural and beautiful choice to approach the one. Is it not the most natural and beautiful choice to approach the one who fashioned us, the one who always listens to our supplication and the one who holds the ultimate power to forgive. One of Allah Azawajal's divine 99 names and attributes is Al-Ghafah, the one whose forgiveness knows no limits, invites us to seek his pardon directly. The simplest study of the prohibition of shirk unearths a wealth of benefits. The most obvious of them regarding Tawbah is the direct connection it establishes between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't it make perfect sense to approach the one who has fashioned us directly, the one who always answers our supplications, the only lawmaker and judge who knows our true intentions and has ultimate power and authority to forgive? Talba, my beloved brothers and sisters, involves intentional initiative, taking and going straight to the source of forgiveness, Allah al rafa the one whose forgiveness is unlimited and the one who completely forgives our sins and faults. This also protects us again from those who are incapable and unsanctioned to speak on behalf of Allah, but also from the potential harm associated with opportunists looking to take advantage of our vulnerability and guilt. Humans may be harsh and lack the compassion necessary for those who are struggling with their internal demons, immorality, and sin. No one can be all merciful, and no one can surpass the merciful. The Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu said, do good deeds properly, sincerely, and moderately, and receive good news because one's good deeds will not make them enter paradise. They asked, even you, O Messenger of Allah? He said, even I, and less until Allah bestows his pardon and mercy on me. But Allah keeps his promise, and we keep our promise by repenting, by turning to Allah and being rebirthed. The Prophet ﷺ said, even I, and less until Allah bestows his pardon and mercy on me. Allah's immediate response to Adam, his being forgiven and then honored as a noble prophet with the promise of returning to paradise becomes a source of relief, a source of hope, a source of comfort, a source of motivation and encouragement to every sinner and invokes gratitude to the one 
through showers, countless blessings, countless na'am, the na'am that we cannot even contemplate, we cannot count the blessings and the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that should invoke gratitude to the one who showers us with it. MashaAllah. <clears throat> The psychological, spiritual, and moral impact of Tawbah on a person who may otherwise stray into further disobedience and heedlessness or fall into despair cannot, 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 my beloved, beloved brothers and sisters, be ignored. Understanding Tawbah brings a river of tremendous benefit, enabling us to cultivate and strengthen a personal relationship and gnosis of trust and love with the creator as we experience spiritual growth and build the resolve needed for our moral development. Most importantly, Talba brings about again, hope and motivation. Surah three, verse 135, and those who, when they commit an immorality, are wrong themselves by transgressions. When they commit immoralities or wrong themselves, remember Allah and seek forgiveness for their sins. And who can forgive sins except Allah? And who do not persist in what they have done while they know? MashaAllah. Again, I cannot reiterate enough, my beloved brothers and sisters, the mercy of Allah, the kindness of Allah. We were born sinless with individual responsibility as a divine gift. In the pure light of Islam, every human being enters this world free of sin. We come into 85% of the humans born in this world come into, into this world in prostration to Allah out of the womb in sujood, only the ones who are breech birth or cesarean do not come out in this manner literally, but we all come out on the fitra of Allah. We all came out as Muslims. This profound truth rooted in the Quran and the Sunnah rejects the concept of original sin, emphasizing that we were each born with the potential for righteousness and the responsibility for our own actions. We cannot blame others. And when we do blame others, we are committing the sin of injustice on another person. Unlike doctrines that suggest we inherit or must seek salvation through others, we inherit sins from others or must seek salvation through others, Islam empowers us to forge our own path guided by our relationship, our personal, sincere relationship with Allah, as I would Allah the Exalted. Islam, the Quran, and the Sunnah reject the concept of original sin and does not blame the sins of Eve as the enticer, the temptress, resulting in women of all time bearing the consequences of her actions. The belief that all humans inherit the sin of Adam and Eve arose from the doctrine of original sin, which was advanced by Augustine of Hippo in 334 to three, 334 to 430 in the Common Era. He theorized that all humans were born sinful and must accordingly seek salvation through sacramental channels such as penance and baptism to evolve, to absolve them of sin. This doctrine was opposed by some Christian scholars and was later revised by the Roman Catholic Church regarding the fate of those who die in infancy and is no longer held to universally. Some still conduct infinite baptisms, believing that that will save that child, that the child doesn't have any responsibility because Jesus did it all for them. And this came, comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The belief that all humans inherit the sin of Adam and Eve, advanced by the doctrine of original sin, stands in the starkest contrast to the Islamic understanding of our nature. Islam teaches that every soul is born pure, untouched by the sins of their ancestors, 
and endowed with the freedom to choose its own destiny. This is a reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite mercy and justice where each person is accountable only for their own deeds and no sin can be passed on or inherited. And of course, there are other doctrines with similar claims. The doctrine or the belief in karma, the result of which a person born into a lower caste or below the system entirely, such as the Dalites, the Dalites, sorry, untouchables, are virtually exiled as the lowest of society. The Quran asserts, asserts that every human is born innocent, free from sin of their predecessors. Historically, their station was on the sole basis of their birth into the ancient Hindu hierarchy, which once considered them punished and unworthy with no scope for redemption in this life for the misdeeds of a past life. This has since turned into the practice of subjecting them to severe social and economic injustices to this day. Despite the reform movements within the religion, in addition to the global outcry for civil rights, pacifying is nothing short of an oppressive apartheid. Iblis classified Adam as less than him. Much of humanity has been plagued by its own forms of religious and social classism, which are sadly rampant in the decisiveness or the divisiveness, I should say, racism and injustice visible in most, if not all, societies throughout history. I am sad to say that the Muslim world has sadly strayed from its own teachings in this regard, and it has not been spared from the consequences of this ignorance and tyranny. This divine justice also teaches us that no one can intercede, can intercede for another without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. Each of us holds the key to our own salvation, and through sincere repentance, we can always return to Allah's mercy. The story of Adam and Hawa serves as a timeless reminder Though they were deceived by Iblis and fell into sin, they sought forgiveness directly from Allah and were forgiven before him being sent to this earth, setting the precedent for all humanity. Surah 7, verse 22 and 23, so he, Iblis, made them fall through deception. And when they tasted the tree, their private parts became apparent to them and they began to fasten together out of guilt we talked about guilt before, over themselves from the leaves of paradise. And the Lord called to them, did I not forbid you both from that tree and tell you that Satan is to you a clear enemy? They said, our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. We have transgressed against ourselves. And if you do not forgive us and have mercy upon us, we will surely be among the losers. In this, we see the beauty of individual responsibility, a call to each of us to live righteously, to seek forgiveness when we falter, and to strive continuously to improve in the eyes of Allah as a wajal. Imam al-Ghazali wisely noted, our covenant with Allah is a personal one, where we are individually responsible for our choices. We are also reminded of our communal duties, to seek knowledge, enjoin good, and forbid evil, actions that ripple through society, influencing others and shaping our collective future. This is a powerful reminder that our actions have profound impacts, not only on ourselves, but on those around us. There is a well-known hadith narrated by Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which states kindness is not to be found in anything, but that it adds to its beauty. And it is not withdrawn from anything, but it makes it perfect. This hadith emphasizes the importance of kindness and how it enhances the beauty of any action or situation. Do any of you consider it kindness when somebody comes and beats you up because you sinned or you made a mistake, not even intentionally? This hadith emphasizes the importance of kindness when it comes to forgiveness and how it enhances the beauty of any action or situation. 
when kindness is present, it beautifies. And when it is absent, it detracts from the overall good. And I encourage you that whenever you address your spouses, you address them with beauty. Whenever you address your children, you address them with beauty. Whenever you address the neighbor near and far, you address them with beauty. Al Ghazali, who died in 1111 in the Common Era, wrote extensively on the topic of repentance and dedicated an entire book to it in his monumental work, Ulam ad The Revival of Religious Sciences, describing the nature of the covenant between human and God as being an individual one between the servant and his master, while also pointing out that society as a whole has a collective or communal responsibility to safeguard itself from injustice and transgression. He says, the community is not the source of salvation, but rather it is by divine will and command an area of responsibility in which humanity can either pursue obedience or disobedience. So if we don't pursue it, then we are sinning and we will need to repent. This is apparent in the communal responsibility to seek knowledge and join good and forbid evil as taught by the messenger of Allah who said, whoever among you sees an evil action and they are able to change it with their hand then change it with their hand by taking action. If they cannot do it with their hand, then with their tongue by speaking out kindly. And if they cannot, then with their heart by hating it and feeling that it is wrong. And with their heart is the weakest of faith. So Allah calls us to personal responsibility and communal responsibility. This teaches us that everyone is born innocent and that personal repentance is always possible. We are also reminded in closing again of our communal responsibility when the Prophet Wasallam taught that we should enjoin good and forbid evil in the Quran. He says in chapter 3, verse 104, and let there arise from you a nation inviting to all that is good, inviting to repentance, enjoining what is right, and forbidding what is wrong with kindness and beauty, and those will be successful. So there is a right way to implement Tawbah, and it must always be done with beauty and dignity. It is also understood from this that one's actions may have a positive or negative effect on others, such that both the individual as well as the one inspired to do good will have their own share of reward for doing so, and likewise the one inspired to do evil as a result will have their own share of sin.